May I begin? <laughs> There's actually no one who uh, introduced mm. you. I can introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, am I supposed to do that, Sonjin? I. I'm actually the. Ho am I actually the host? <laughs> the miscommunication. But okay. All right. Thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of you. Uh, for attending this workshop. So this is a regular workshop of our SSK project, which is now unfortunately online, but this is our third year and uh, I'm one of the members and I'm very glad that I could join this group because I learned a lot from uh, working together with Korean scholars. And now I'm very glad that I can introduce some of my Japanese colleagues to uh, Korean speaking uh, scholars so that we can have more mutual understanding between Japan and Korea and maybe in the near future China and other Asian countries. But in any case, uh, today I would like to introduce uh, Kei Ehara, who is Associate Professor of Political Economy at Oita University. He's actually as old as I am. And we are good friends. And uh, even though, as you will see, we have uh, different interpretations uh, because today, uh, Kei Ehala will talk about the problem of value form, introducing this debate between Samezo Kuruma and Kozo Uno. And uh, Kei is actually uh, one of the young leading uh, Uno scholar in Japan, and I am actually a supporter of the interpretation of Samezo Kuruma. So we actually come from different backgrounds, but we are also uh, working closely recently. So I think the audience will learn how this debate in Japan developed in the 50s or the 40s and 50s and now how it is further discussed in the 21st century. So, okay, please uh, welcome Kei Ehala and uh, I will also comment later, but we look forward to the, your presentation. Thank you, Kohei. I'm Kei Ehala and thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to talk today. And um, in la last year, I visited um, so for the first time of my life and I really enjoyed your um, hospitality there and I was really looking forward to visit again this year but very unfortunately um, COVID-19 crisis has happened and uh, we lost the opportunity and but um, I'm really I'm really happy that you've organize this online meeting and can at least um, discuss some arguments about Marx and Marxism online and keep our international solidarity. So um, today, and this is my first um, chance to give an English online presentation, so I feel a bit nervous, but I'll try my best. Um, today, the title of my presentation is Expressing Value Quantitatively, and we are going to talk about the value form analysis, as Kohei introduced. And this is what Marx investigated in Chapter 1 of Capital Volume 1, as you know. And this field is one of the most polemic topics in Japanese Marxism. And the leading figures in this area are Samezo Kuruma and Kozo Uno. And these two debated each other for almost 30 years and molded the following discussions, in, discussions of Malkian value theory in Japan. So I would like to introduce the debate between the two, Kuruma Uno debate, and present my idea about it after that. 
And actually, to be honest, and I have been grown up as a marketing researcher in the traditions of Uno West background, as Kohei introduced. So I actually can't help being sympathized with Uno's idea rather than Kuruma's. However, I assume Uno's value form analysis is now faced with a very big difficulty in studying modern economic phenomena, including financialization, etc. And I believe Kuruma's careful reading of Marx helps us overcome Uno's shortcomings. It is now necessary to synthesize these different viewpoints of Kuruma and Uno to make value form analysis more relevant to understand our age. Okay, what we focus on today is the simple isolated or accidental form of value. This is the value relation of the two commodities, say linen and coat, and it's shown like 20 yards of linen are worth one coat. Here the linen expresses its value in the coat, and the linen is placed in the relative form of value, and the coat is in the equivalent form. And the Kurama Uno debate is about the interpretation of these simple form of value. And let us first take a look at who these two figures are. Samezo Kuruma taught the history of economics at Hosei, Univer Hosei University, which is a private university in Tokyo. He also worked as the head of Ohara Institute for Social Research, which is a prestigious institute in the field of social science in Japan. His publications are recently translated into English in the Braille series, historical materialism book series by the translation of Mikhail Shawati, I think who is now here. And he is now teaching at Miyazaki University, which is placed next to Oito, uh, where I am now. The first title here, Mark's theory of the genesis of money, how, why, and through what is a commodity money, discusses the value form analysis. And the latter one, in pursuit of Mark's theory of crisis, is about the theory of crisis as, as titled. And the latter one is now Mr. Shawati is preparing. Kuruma is famous for his careful and serious understanding of Marx. And he took the initiative in Japanese study of Marx manuscripts and had, a, had an influence on Teinosuke Otani, who is the most famous Japanese scholar of studying Marx manuscripts. Meanwhile, Kozo Uno first, first taught economic policies at Tohoku University in pre-World War II period. After the war, he worked at the University of Tokyo and Hosei University. His outstanding feature lies in its unique reorganization of Marx's framework, and his critique of Marx's capital resulted in his reorganization of basic, basic theory of capitalism, which is shown in the principles of political economy, translated in, in English in 1980s, by Thomas Sekine. Also, he used his basic theory to analyze the historical transformation of economic policies under capitalism and wrote the textbook translated in English under the title of the Types of Economic Policies under Capitalism, which was published in, in 2016 from Braille series. This study of history is called the Stages Theory in Unoist theory. Uno's influence was so big that there arose a group of people who were called the Uno school or Unoists. Though Uno himself belonged to the Institute of Social Science when he was at the University of Tokyo, his influence reached out the Faculty of Economics there, and many Unoist researchers were educated there, including Makoto Uno, uh, no, I mean Makoto Ito. The battle between Kuruma and Uno began at a round table talk on, uh, on Marx Capital, which was held in 1947 and later published in the form of book in 1948. The participants were Hyobe Ouchi, Samezo Kuruma, Itsuro Sakisaka, Kozo Uno, Hiromi Arisawa, Takao Tsuchiya, Shigeru Aihara, Saburo Kazaki, Koichiro Suzuki, and Shigeki Suenaga. In this round table talk, Uno said that, I want to pose the fundamental question in considering the fact that the linen is 
in the relative form of value and the court in the equivalent form, is it really satisfactory to not consider why the linen has taken the court for its equivalent form and to not premise the linen owner's desire for the court? Uno here proposed to introduce the owner of the commodity and his or her desire in the value form analysis. And nobody there agreed to Uno's notion. Even Koichiro Suzuki didn't. Uh, actually, Koichiro Suzuki later became professor at the Faculty of Economics, the University of Tokyo, and led Unoist group there. But he actually didn't agree with Uno's notion at that time. According to Uno's recollection, this roundtable talk was thrown into confusion due to his argument. It became impossible to take notes, so they did it once again. Uno was complaining that all opponents were now ready to argue against him in the second discussion, and it was difficult for me to for him to refute back. After that, Koichiro Suzuki recommended Uno to write about the theory of value, and it was published in 1947 here. This book covers the concepts of commodity, money, and capital, which are the contents of what is called the doctrine of circulation in Uno's principles of political economy. Here, Uno deals with the value form analysis and emphasizes how important it is to consider the commodity owner in value form analysis when we are to effectively refute Bimba Belk's criticism of Marx's labor theory of value. And it was Kuruma who responded to Uno's theory of value. Kuruma wrote an article titled Theory of the Value Form and Theory of the Exchange Process and pointed out Uno's interpretation of Marx is wrong. We will see later how Uno wrongly interpreted Marx. Uno did not withdraw his own opinion, even if his interpretation was incorrect, since Uno was determined to establish his original theory of political economy based on his understanding of value form analysis. Uno immediately argued back in an article, the issue of the theory of the value form, Kuruma also quickly, quickly responded in these two articles. The round two of the debate was concerning the function of money, the measure of value. Based his own understanding of value form, Uno insisted that the value is only subjectively expressed when the commodity is priced and that the value is finally measured when the commodity is purchased. And this idea again raised Kuruma's criticism. The debate continued until their later lives. Here, I would like to mention that at least with regard to Kuruma Uno debate, Uno's idea is not at all available in English. People often think Uno is more famous than Kuruma in English speaking world, but this is not true, I think, when we discuss the Kuruma Uno debate. Actually, this is thanks to Mikhail Shawati, because uh, he really did very nice effort to introduce Kuruma's debate in, in English by translating his um, articles. So I believe it is necessary to introduce Uno's idea, as well as Kuruma's, of course, in order to wholly grasp the largest theoretical controversy in Japanese Marxism. Anyway, let us look, take a look into how these two figures were in conflict in interpreting the simple value form. The most controversial matter was how to grasp this passage. For example, through what quo value thing being equated to the linen, the labor embedded in the court is equated to the labor embedded in the linen. It is true that the tailoring which makes the court is concrete labor of a different sort than the weaving which makes the linen. But by equating, no, I mean, but by being equated to the weaving, the tailoring is in fact reduced to what is actually equal between the two kinds of labor, which is the characteristic they have in common as human labor. Through this detour, 
weaving too, in so far as it weaves value, it, it has nothing to distinguish it from tailoring and consequently is abstract human labor. Uno discusses in his theory of value published in 1947 regarding this detour as follows. The linen owner must express the value of linen through another use value that he wants to exchange the linen for, such as a court, for example. This occurs, of course, not because the labor that makes the linen is simply the useful labor of weaving, but rather by means of it being reduced to human labor as a thing equal to the labor that makes the court, or at least as the thing in common, between the two different types of concrete labor. But this is certainly not immediate, immediately carried out as the, the abstract human labor, the two have in common, being rather an abstraction carried out via the detour of the weaving labor of the linen being equated to the concrete tailoring labor of the court. For the linen's value to be able to be expressed in the court, the premise to begin with is that the linen must make itself equal to the court but if this is carried out, we enter into the issue of the owner of the linen, offering the linen for the, for the certain amount of courts that he desires. Consequently, Uno became to regard the simple value form as a quantitative relation between two commodities. In his principles of political economy, Uno maintains in this so-called simple or elementary value form, a definite quantity of courts, one, two, etc., must first be chosen as a use value by the, the owner of linen. And this is because the linen owner must determine how many courts he or she wants when the simple value form is constituted. After that, the linen owner sets aside 20 yards or some such appropriate quantity of its own commodity which he is willing to part with, given the desired quantity of courts. And this quantity of court determines the appropriate quantity of linen that should be counter-offered in exchange. It should be noted here that Uno did not assert that the use value of coats in equivalent form determines the quantity of linen in the relative form of value. Many opponents of Uno deem Uno's value theory is a mere utility theory of value, but it is a complete misunderstanding in my view. Indeed, Uno insisted that the desire of the commodity owner should be taken into account in order to explain why certain sort of commodity is placed in the equivalent form. However, Uno never mentions the utility of commodity when the quantity of the value relation is determined. But I don't mean Uno was perfect. Kuruma's criticism of Uno was actually very appropriate at least in terms of the reading of Marx. Kurma wrote, detour of the weaving labor of the linen being equated to the concrete tailoring labor of the court. This Uno's notion is not a detour at all. Instead of a commodity declaring itself to be valued by di directly equating itself to another commodity, it first equates the other commodity to itself positing that commodity with determinate being as the value body, and upon that basis, it expresses its own value in the natural form of another commodity. And this is the true meaning of the detour. So Uno incorrectly considered the linen was equated to the court. This is an opposite to what Marx regarded as detour, according to Kuruma. Actually, Marx elucidated that it was the court that was equated to the linen. In order to express the value of the linen, the linen must take a roundabout way to equate itself to the other commodities I caught. Kurama goes on to say, here we need to pay particular attention to the fact that the value equation 20 years of linen are worth one cup. The linen does not immediately posit itself equivalent to the court to obtain the form of value. Rather, it posits the court as equivalent to itself, thus giving the court the formal character as the direct embodiment of abstract human labor as the value body 
but it is upon this basis that the linen can first express its own value through the natural form of the court that, that has this existence as the embodiment of value. Without such detour, the commodity cannot acquire the, value, the form of value. The linen cannot become the value body by immediately equating itself to the court, thereby declaring itself to be equal to the court, which would be a presumptuous act. In Kuruma's understanding, Uno allowed this presum presumptuous act of linen and overlooked the mechanism of value expression, consequently reducing the value form into a superficial relation of exchange. Nevertheless, Uno's value form analysis gradually got dominance in Japanese academia in spite of his mis misinterpretation of Marx. I think this was because Uno's value form as an exchange process has made value form analysis more like economics rather than philosophical or sociological arguments. And this was crucial in Japanese contexts since Marx has been mainly studied in the Faculty of Economics in Japanese universities. In Japan, Marx is not treated as one of the myriads of philosophers. Marx has been the core of the study of economics that competes against micro or, micro or macro economics, which are together called modern economics in Japan. I myself was educated in the Faculty of Economics and still teaching in the Faculty of Economics. It was necessary to establish the field of Marxian study as Marxian economics in Japanese universities. And I think Uno arguably contributed to this establishment. However, Uno's shortcomings are the flip side of his success, I think. And the emphasis on the, the exchange process led him to under, uh, underestimate the value expression mechanism as Kuruma suggested. Also the contemporary market phenomena are uh, undermining Uno's theorization. Modern financial market is not necessarily the field of commodity exchange, but also the field of evaluation of various assets. The prices of assets fluctuate without being exchanged. They change as financial markets change their evaluations. And one change in the price of certain asset may cause a chain reaction of changing other assets. Unot value from analysis falls short in investigating these contemporary issues. And I suppose Kuruma's accurate interpretation should be appreciated again to analyze these phenomena. Kuruma focuses on the value expression as such and arose a following debate regarding how the equivalent could express the value of the commodity in the relative form of value. The court becomes the value body when it expresses the value of the linen. The term value body is a translation of Weltkörper, but there is also a term called value thing or Weltding. And the meanings of these terms were investigated following Kuruma's detailed readings. Nevertheless, it fell into a, a somewhat pedantic argument. And in my opinion, the achievement was unfortunately not so great. And this philological discussion could not effectively make an impact on the argument of economics in which UNO researchers were engaged. I it was not clear how the value expression problematic affects a quantitative aspect of value form. I suspect Kuruma's argument led people to concentrate exclusively on the qualitative aspect of value form. And this attitude sounds like leave a quantitative discussion to vulgar economics. I assume this would be fatal to Japanese Marxian traditions where Marx's theory was accepted as economics. So we have to overcome a formalistic dichotomy, I think, between equality and quantity, and effectively show how Marxian study contributes to quantitative issues um, treated in economics. So I would like to find out how the value form analysis could be quantitatively recaptured without falling into UNOist Narrow, narrowly defined notion of the exchange process. In order to do that, we have to show that value could be expressed not only as quality, but, as, but also as quantity. You might think it is not a question at all. The value is an abstract human labor, so it is 
quantitatively grasped, grasped as labor time. However, we all know that the value is not expressed in terms of labor time in reality. It is expressed in a quantitative relation of commodities. So we have, we have to ask how and why the value cannot be expressed in terms of labor time and must be expressed otherwise. I assume Marx found something that cannot be identified as a, a, abstract hum, human labor in value. And this is why Marx had to develop the value form analysis even after he clarified the substance of value. And we could find Marx's careful analysis in the introduction of the section of value form analysis. The section begins with this paragraph, commodities here, commodities coming to the world in the form of used values or material goods, such as iron, linen, coin, etc. This is their plain, homely, natural form. However, they are only commodities because they have a dual nature, because they are at the same time objects of utility and bearers of value. Therefore, they only appear as commodities or have the form of commodities insofar as they possess a double form, i.e. natural form and value form. Here we find the term value form is used as an opposite of the term natural form, or, or in this context, Wachenkilpe, commodity body. This makes us imagine that the natural form is an expression of use value and the value form is an expression of value, a simple corresponding relation of the two factors of commodities. However, the next paragraph has a slightly different configuration. It says the objectivity of commodities as value differs from them quickly in the sense that a man knows where, not where to have it. Not an atom of matter enters into the objectivity of commodities as values. In this, it is the direct opposite of the coercively censured objectivity, which is a translation, which is the translation of Zinlich Korben Gegenständlichkeit of commodities as physical objects. Let us remember that commodities possess an, an object character, objective character as values which is the translation of Vektgenständlichkeit, only in as they are all expressions of an identical social substance, human labor, that their object character as values is therefore a pure social. Here, the commodity as physical object, or Wachenkörper, is considered to have the coercively sensual subjectivity, or Zinglich Korben Gegenständlichkeit, and this is an opposite of the value objectivity or what is called Wechtgegenständlichkeit. And it is this Wechtgegenständlichkeit that would be grasped in a purely social relation, namely value form. This long word Wechtgegenständlichkeit first appears here in Marx Capital Volume 1. This might be regarded as what must be expressed in the quantitative relation of commodities, not in the amount of labor time. In fact, we can trace how this word, Wechtgegenständlichkeit, was introduced in these opening paragraphs using Mark Engels Gesamtausgabe. In the introduction of value form analysis in the first edition of Capital Volume 1, we cannot find this word actually. It says the analysis of value has the form of commodity, it must have a dual form, the form of use value and the form of value. The form of use value is the form of commodity body itself, iron, linen, etc., and it's handily grasped sensuous existence form. It is the natural form of commodity. The value form is, on the contrary, the social form. Paragraph has a similar structure of the first paragraph we quoted from the second edition of Capital Volume 1. The term natural form is an opposite of the term value form. On the other hand, while the natural form is considered to have sensuous character, the feature of the value form is not much examined. 
it seems Marx felt necessary to explain more about what is expressed in the body form. In Mega 26, the additions and changes, Ergänzungen und Veränderungen, from the first edition to the second edition, are available. In this introductory part, there are four stages of amendment, which are distinguished as A, B, C, and D in Mega. In part A, we already find the term Weltgegenständlichkeit, like Weltgegenständlichkeit, that, that is different from manifold objectivity of use, uh, which is here. Or in a phrase like Weltgegenständlichkeit, a single isolated commodity remains invisible, for it is the ob opposite of visible Wachenkilpe. Like here. This adjective, invisible, is not used in the second edition, so we could assume Marx was not satisfied with this description. Marx wanted to describe the term Weltgegenständlichkeit more precisely, I assume. In part B here, Marx used the phrase not sensuously percept perceptible, nicht sinnlich wahrnehmbar, but Marx seemed still unsatisfied as he did not leave it in the current edition. In part C, Marx wrote the commodities come to the world in the form of used valley or a Wachenkilpe. It is their plain natural form. Their ghostly Weltgegenständlichkeit is, on the contrary, not perceptible. Rather, each characteristic through which the commodities are sensuously distinguished with each other are extinguished. This one. The terminology found here reminds us of phantom-like objectivity of abstract human labor, in which all its sensuous characteristics are extinguished. So Marx, in writing this part C, intended to explain Weltgegenständlichkeit as practically identical with the substance of value, which he examined in earlier sections. However, Marx abandoned this analogy to abstract human labor in part D. He illustrated that Weltgegenständlichkeit has no material stuff in a sharp contrast to the, the objectivity of Wacken Fleisch the commodity flesh. This word commodity flesh, the Viking flesh, reminds us of the quotation from Shakespeare. In King Henry IV, Falstaff calls them quickly neither fish nor flesh. A man knows not where to hug her. So the change from part C to D, tells us that Marx should have thought the concept of Weltgegenständlichkeit is not identical with abstract human labor. However, all Marx could do was to describe it by a metaphor from Shakespeare, it seems. You might think this metaphor of Dame Quickly is just a rhetoric and, and kind of the affected way of referring to the substance of value. And it is true that and this is one possible interpretation. However, the repeated amendments of this part suggest another possibility that Marx struggled to capture what is expressed in the value form that is to be discussed. We could view Weltgegenständlichkeit as a special term to refer to the object of value expression different, form, different from the abstract human labor that could be counted in terms of time in terms of times, I mean, in terms of labor times. And if Marx could only explain it by a metaphor, it remains to be recaptured in our own terms. The quantitative expression is my suggestion today about this issue. Weltgegenständlichkeit could be regarded as a quantitative aspect of value. This quantity, however, cannot be reduced to the labor time. This notion resonates with Uno's negative attitude toward labor theory of value in the value form analysis. 
the object of value expression is something different from what labor creates. Una considered value as homogeneity of commodities based on its critique of Marx. It is, it is surely not a sufficient definition, but unexpectedly, Uno's non-labor theory of value in value form analysis might have something common with Marx's usage of the word Weltgegenständlichkeit. If the object of value expression is a quantitative thing, value must always be expressed quantitatively, not qualitatively. Nevertheless, as we have noted, Uno's value form analysis it itself is out of date. The quantitative expression of value should be viewed not as the ex exchange relation, at least not as the mere exchange relation, but as the evaluative relation. And this means the market is the capitalist system of evaluation and exchange is only the result of evaluation of commodities. I guess Kurama's emphasis on value expression problematic now suggests us to reinvestigate the market system as a system of ev evaluation. The, form, the value form analysis must be reconsidered as the foundation of market evaluation system, which should be an analyzed as an economic issue. Finally, I would like to again stress why the quantitative expression matters. The evaluative relation could be the fundamental concept of heterodox economics regarding the market theory. It would be dogmatic and too narrow-minded to conclude that it would be normal action if you deal with the quantitative aspects of value form, I assume. And there is the utility theory of value on the, on the one hand, and there is the labor theory of value on the other. We could think of the third way of theorizing value theory, a quantitative value form expression to rebuild Marxian economics. Furthermore, recaptured value form analysis would be open to more diversified concept of money. One of the big constraints of Marx theory today is its conceptualization of money as a gold money, I assume. However, if we view value form analysis, I mean, sorry, if we view value form as an evaluative relation, we could analyze money as the ultimate evaluation standard and the possession could be occupied by a gold, but it is not the only possibility. Thus, we could be more open to discuss the theory of money. Considering value form as a quantitative expression would be a starting point to conceptualize money again in Marxian studies. So I would like to stop here and please start the discussion, Kohei. Thank you so much. So basically, Kay summarized the debate between Kozo Uno and Samezo Kuruma, but he also added some of the aspect because I believe that the K thinks that the UNO's argument must be modified or revised in the face of Kuruma's critique. But K is also not quite satisfied or entire, not entirely satisfied with uh, Kuruma's correct interpretation of Marx's value form. So he's trying to kind of combine the quantitative aspect of Uno's interpretation of value form, we based up on Kuluma's more correct understanding of value form. And it is interesting that he actually uh, used mega and especially the volume which contains Ergenzungen and Verendalungen. Uh, this is a manuscript that Marx prepared between the first and the second edition of Capital, volume one of Capital. And in this manuscript, she intensively writes uh, or reworks up on the section on value form. And it is interesting how Uno school usually doesn't deal with this kind of manuscript and they don't usually <laughs> read it in German. Uh, but I was surprised that today uh, Kay carefully followed the four 
stages like ABC. He Marx actually divides the manuscript of ABCD and he tried to rework and rework on this section. And it, it's interesting that K discussed this section to ground his own argument. And maybe it's surprising to Korean audience that <laughs> we like Japanese scholars spend so much time on analyzing this uh, part in the beginning of volume one of Capital. But I believe that this is like one of the most important debates. Actually, it's not exaggeration. It's one of the most important debates in the history of Japanese Marxism. And it is a clear contrast to people like David Harvey, for example, who in his introduction to Capital simply dismisses uh, value form as something like very difficult to understand and even it's not very important, etc. So uh, Japanese scholars actually tried to show why this part is quite essential in order to understand Marx's critique of political economy. And it's interesting because Marx himself admits that it's this part is very difficult. And I think today, Considering the history that, you know, when scholars simply talk about this difficult part, they can kind of authorize themselves, right? I mean, okay, we can understand this and we can correctly explain and you activists or you workers don't understand this. So follow us or like we are authorized to, or we are entitled to just study capital because we can read German, we can understand Hegelian concepts, etc. So I, I, I remember reading Mike Davis and he ironically commented how this difficulty of the beginning of volume one of capital functioned as a tool for scholars to justify themselves. <laughs> You know, but Marx himself was actually a revolutionary. He wrote Capital for Workers, etc. But uh, so I think, in order not to repeat this kind of mistake, this kind of self-satisfaction with Germans, I think it's very important to show why this part, why this discussion on value form is important today to understand capitalism and to understand. Uh, the contradictions and limits of the capitalist model production. And in this sense, it is, I, I actually respect uh, Kay's uh, attempt uh, that he is not simply satisfied that uh, Kuluma provided a kind of correct understanding of Marx's discussion. Because I admit that this is a kind of tendency of Kuruma school that they say, okay, this is what Marx said, but the Kuruma school just stops there quite often and they don't really develop how that correctness can be utilized to analyze contemporary capitalism or like our society and how we can criticize uh, contemporary society. So I understand what uh, K is trying to do. K is trying to update uh, Marx theory in the age of uh, in the age of capitalism where gold doesn't function as a standard anymore. And he tried to bring up a new kind of theory of money, I assume. But at the same time, I also wonder if uh, this is really the part where we should focus in order to achieve this aim because I think that as the concept of bit gegen ständigkeit uh, clearly indicates ständigkeit you can translate it as kind of objectiveness or objectivity I think in order to emphasize the qualitative character we could say objectiveness so the lichkeit the Gegenständlich is adjective, objective, right? So, but the Lichkeit usually can be translated as ness, so objectiveness. I think this 
translation clearly suggests that Marx is actually working on the qualitative aspect. And he even dismisses here in this discussion, uh, the quantitative aspect because, and he just simply equalizes Linen and Court directly without quantifying them. Because Marx is basically trying to do, uh, because what Marx is basically trying to do is explain how value can be expressed, value that is not visible and that is phantom-like must be expressed. It must be visible in certain way so that this problem of value expression is not necessarily quantitative issue, I assume. It is more like a qualitative issue, right? This is, is we can, the problem is not easy. The problem would be easy if we could touch or smell or we could sensibly measure, but the problem is that the value is not visible. So it must be expressed somehow and it must be objectified. It must attain certain kind of objectivity. This is the objectiveness. This is a bad Gegenständigkeit. And I, th I, I still think that this is actually a problem of quality. And I wonder why you sort of criticize, uh, for example, you say like dichotomy of quality and quantity. And I, I'm not quite sure, you know, the argument must be step by step. And here, I guess, I, I, I assume that Marx is just talking about qualitative aspect. And I think it is fine. I think it fulfills what the theory of value form is supposed to show or demonstrate. That's uh, like my first impression. And there's, secondly, so, the last slide, you sort of suddenly talks about money. And I kind of got the impression of uh, a theoretical jump or logical jump uh, between uh, the previous slides and the last slide. So maybe you could clarify a bit more about why I think these two issues are related. I think you brought in the quantitative aspect because in the end, you want to talk about money. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about your aim, how your understanding of value form would contribute to this uh, new understanding, maybe not new, but a more precise understanding of today's money. Thank you, Kohei, for detailed comment. And um, you raised two questions. The first question is why um, the why we need to discuss qualitative aspects in value form analysis. And I think um, I'm not to um, dismiss the qualitative aspect in value form. And I, and it is true that Marx's qualitative aspects uh, made very um, pro progress um, from like Adam Smith and Ricardo's value theory. So we owe very much to Marx's qualitative um, discussion in this value form analysis. Um, but I, I think um, Marx's study of quantitative aspects of value form analysis is a bit too weak because he really concentrates on how value is expressed, expressed qualitatively and wrote many texts in pages, but he didn't 
actually argue how this qualitative argument was um, available in investigating the quantitative relation, which is in reality, we um, see the quantitative relations like in terms of uh, yen or dollar or won. So we have to um, use it to, we have to be able to use it. You, I mean, we have to be able to use the quantitative qualitative analysis to decipher um, why the value have to be quantitatively expressed. <laughs> so um, I'm not, I am not confident that um, I, I could um, express uh, the, the supposed, supposedly significant um, argument of myself, but um, I would like um, later on, I have to elaborate how to um, emphasize this my um, argument of mine. And the second thing, um, the theory of money, um, actually I was thinking about the, the argument about the money of account. Um, today, um, some left and a left study study focus on um, the money of account, like modern money theory, and some post Keynesian economics are discussing the the amount, no, the account, the, the money of account, and they really criticize harshly criticized Marxian theory of money, like this is the old type of theory of money and they just con consider the gold money and it's too out of date. But I think Marx value form analysis is really powerful to investigate today's monetary phenomena and a Marxian theory of money would be the basis to discuss how modern money theory um, is incorrect to discuss the money under capitalism. So today I couldn't reach in the relation between the concept of money and the value form analysis, but I think the analysis of value form should be the foundation of criticizing the theory of money in other um, schools. So this is my aim to study the value form analysis in this, in our age. Okay, I, I stop here. I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't <laughs> demute myself. I, I always have to <laughs> beg for. Me too. <laughs> okay. okay, so maybe you, maybe Kay, can you stop sharing the okay. screen? Okay, so if you have any question, maybe you could briefly introduce yourself and uh, read some question. Okay, Lee. Oh yeah, you can, <laughs> it's, uh, you have to, yeah. 
we have a master here. We, we always, uh, oh yeah. you have to, yes, uh, as you see in the chat, you have to contact first. Right, use the chat function and then right there that I want to talk and then go will demute you. Uh, okay. Uh, Eara Sensei uh, said uh, a very gegen uh, uh, is a, a kind of metaphor from Shakespeare, okay? Um, Marx tried to explain the, I, I think Marx tried to explain the, um, what the meaning of Bechtgegenständlichkeit by using um, the metaphor from Shakespeare. Uh, I think this is um, <laughs> true because- My question um, is Shakespeare's yes. what text, where? Where? Shakespeare's where? Henry Shakespeare, the Fourth. Which, uh, Shakespeare's. Henry the Fourth. Huh? Henry the Fourth. Henry? Henry? Yes. Uh, Henry Four? Henry? Yes, Four. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Thank you. Mm. Good. Any other questions? But right, 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 use the chat and tell our master to give you the right to speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Stalinism, you, you have always have this. <laughs> it's like panopticon. Yeah. Because we, other people don't know who is actually the master, right? So, yeah, yeah. I think they, they understand. <laughs> Okay. All right, so Martina wants to speak. Yeah, hello. Okay, hi. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm uh, studying at Kyungsang University. Uh, I'm from Germany. And I have wow. a question. I don't know um, if, I, if this question is appropriate or not. Uh, but appropriate or appropriate question, I don't know. But um, so if I understood right that um, uh, that you, uh, that uh, UK Ihara, you, you talked about um, the uh, money um, that, uh, no, uh, not the money, the uh, value form or the Wertgegenständlichkeit being um, uh, overly, or overly uh, on its uh, qualitative aspect, um, being focused overly on that aspect uh, rather than on its qu quantitative aspect. And then also this quantitative aspect not being um, labor time, right? Did I understand yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I have a problem with that because um, I mean, I didn't research about this, or so maybe I have a lack of information, and or I don't understand this well. But then um, um, I don't, um, I don't, I don't get, for example, when that financial um, crisis, the housing bubble came up in two thousand seven, and um, and ever and evaluation there back then in, in capitalism was based on, uh, on specu speculation, right? Yeah. So it was, based, uh, it was not based on reality, on what really was, um, I mean, what really was being produced. And I guess the gap between money, between value and uh, real, uh, mm. on real produced goods, there was a big gap. So um, 
this uh, puts me into a situation where I want to ask, um, so is it not, uh, uh, nevertheless, is it not uh, human labor time? Is it not still the focusing point? Because if you don't, um, if you don't work and you have and and your evaluation is based on speculation, uh, not rather than on product, real productivity, then this shows that if you wanna focus on actually on qu qu the quantitative aspect, um, wait wait wait, I'm a bit nervous. I guess. <laughs> but if you want to focus on the quantitative aspect, uh, while not uh, taking the labor time, I have the, the feeling it goes up into the idealist sphere of things. I mean, mm. correct me if I'm... I don't feel comfortable with this thought, you know? Uh, I, th I think uh, you are going into the very uh, critical point and mm. and um, yeah today the financial values are not a real value at all and uh, it's as you mentioned it's the speculation was rampant in the financial market and uh, the nominal value is really huge um, compared to the compared to what we produce in actual terms and I think this is what capitalism is um, under the capitalism the value um, is just what is evaluated in the market and this is not necessarily correspond to what we produce by the work or real labor. So I think we do not have to um, persist to the concept of value with what, what, produ what, what is produced in real terms. And we, I think we could regard value in within, uh, in, in what is, regarded as value in the market terms. So, and this is what we can criticize capitalism in based on our understanding of value theory and value form analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hmm. Okay, the uh, next is Tainako Sensei. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Ehara. So I'm very interested in your last comment. Uh, as far as you say uh, that uh, today's uh, uh, money markets are rather far from what Marx uh, uh, formally theorizes no? as uh, uh, theory of money. So such, uh, there is such a great distance between both, no? uh, I agree. And uh, you said that uh, Beat Gegenständlichkeit is not identical with abstract human labor. You yes. are right, no? you are right. And also you said that uh, a quantitative aspect of value cannot be counted in terms of labor time. No? This is also yes. uh, partly right mm, uh, because uh, now labor is different from object. Mm. So, but uh, the next step you have done uh, is rather problematic. Mm. Uh, so in your theory, in your mm, interpretation, uh, so what is money and what is the uh, evaluation system of capitalism? This is not clear. You didn't explain. You, you said only, uh, how shall I explain? Today's uh, complicated uh, 
uh, market system is far from Marx, Marxian uh, principles. You know? uh, if you may be right, but you cannot explain the fundamental uh, definition of what you mean by evaluation system. Mm. And uh, uh, my uh, so uh, second question is, in your theory, uh, the difference between value and price is no more uh, <laughs> necessary. And uh -huh. only price system in the market is necessary, you know, so simple. Mm. And therefore, in, if, you, if we follow your um, hypothesis, we don't need any connection, any mm. uh, reference to Marxian, Marxian economics. So Marx's theory of capital, a normal starting point from your theory of today's market theory. Uh, how do you still stick to mm -hmm. Marxian principles? So this is my question. Okay, thank you, Professor Tairako. And the second question is a um, very traditional one to especially um, what is called in Japanese world Capital, capitalist theorist, Sekai Shihon Shugironja. And um, actually, I am not to dismiss value theory, uh, which is distinguished from price theory. And I think price theory is also necessary, but this is the topic we deal with in the level of analysis in Capital Volume 3, which is um, usually treated as price of production or the theory of market value, etc. And I think, but this is a very concrete analysis and um, relatively concrete analysis in the principles of political economy, but we also need value analysis because price is what is expressed and we need to discuss the expression of price i mean i mean we need to discuss what what is expressed in price and this is what value is so even if we emphasize the quantitative aspect of value, it is not to disregard the object of the expression. So I think uh, we still can discuss what value is, which is different from the price. And the first question, I have not yet um, prepared to propose what the evaluative system is actually is. So I, I cannot answer this question <clears throat> just now, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Huh? Oh, do you uh, want to follow up? No, thank you very much. But uh, I don't uh, still understand uh, what, uh, what do you mean, uh, the difference between value and price. So uh, according mm. to your hypothesis, you cannot, you cannot effectively differentiate value and price, I, I mean. What is the 
difference between value and price in your theory? Mm. Value is the object of expression and price is the result of the expression. So this is the difference. I'm such, such um, for example, the, how to say, um, the weight is the object of expression, but the kilogram or gram or pond, this is the result of the expression of weight. So, but we do not confuse with these two in, in the natural sciences, but so we can distinguish these two, even if we um, are dealing with it in the in the Marxian economics. So um, I think the difference is not very, not so much unclear. Okay, so does anyone have If no one has question anymore, we could end. <laughs> Good. Yeah, actually, this is my first time today to discuss this topic in English. So um, it was really poor presentation. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> Vanessa, Thank you. Good, then. Thank you so much. Uh, oh yeah, if you have one, Mia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't follow all the uh, all the PPTs, but uh, I have one question that uh, you mentioned that. I, I have a, a question about value. Mm, uh, I want to know uh, what what does the what does the meaning that value uh, does not need a quantitative and it can be the qualitative because as far as I know, value is the uh, man's working hours because men when men work work work. Uh, and make make a product, then the value is inside of the product. It it can it can be uh, measured the so working hours, for example. So is it it is what I do. But when you say value, is it different to what I think? Then so I I want to know about your uh, definition of qualitative and quantitative something like that. Um, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can understand the properly or not, but yeah. Sorry, my, um, uh, if I, that's so. Um, sorry? Yes, please, uh, go on. Yeah, my question is, uh, when you mention about value, it is the uh, definition by Marxist idea, or you, you can go further 
from the marks, I mean, mm. but just the qualitative, qualitative form mm. means. Mm. I think um, it was Marx who uh, found um, value cannot be explained um, only from the labor point of view. Um, because Marx, oh, of course, it was Marx who found the substance of value is abstract human labor. But mm -hmm. Marx also, at the same time, Marx also knew that um, value is not grasped in terms of labor time, not only in terms of labor time, but also in terms of um, the quantity of money in real in reality we we know that um all commodity has the price tags yeah. so the value is not really expressed in terms of labor time but in terms of money so we that that's what uh, in in my view that what marx examined in the value form analysis the that value of commodities are not in reality in reality expressed in labor time but in monetary terms so what what i would like to investigate was how the value expression was developed in the value form analysis and um the your, your question includes so then what is value <laughs> and, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. and in in that aspect when, when i uh, emphasize this uh, quantitative aspect the definition of value might be different from marx oh, yeah. i think marx was um Marx defines value in by by using ab, the term abstract human labor, yeah. and didn't say value is not um, composed of labor. Marx said la value is value has um, the connection with the amount of labor. But I it might be too much emphasized the quantitative quantitativeness of value and depart from Marx in terms of the definitions of value and so so, so honestly speaking the my definition of value is separate from that of Marx. So this is, I think, why um, and those people like um, Tairaku Sensei said, uh, you're not Marxian anymore. <laughs> but I think um, the value form analysis itself is really specific to Marxian analysis. So in my view, even if we do not take um, the definition of Marx and in describing what value is. Um, if we stick to value form analysis, we can say, we can regard ourselves as Marxian. Okay, I, thank you very much. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so Thank you so much, Kay, for your presentation. Thank you. And uh, when is the next meeting? Maybe I should say. <laughs> 20, what? <laughs> Demute, send it. Okay. Or use chat. In any case, we will continue to discuss uh, other issues and uh, 
we have a lot of more people coming up in the next few months. So we look forward to you. Oh, Donjin. Oh, on. yes. Oh, December 16th. In two weeks. Ah, yes. Uh, two weeks. Uh, two weeks. Uh, Wednesday, uh, same time, 3 p.m. Uh, Professor uh, Tomonaga. Ah, oh, okay. Tyra yeah. Sensei. Yeah. What is he talking about? What's the topic? Topic or ah uh, okay ah uh, may I may I speak oh yes ah uh, uh, so uh, in two weeks uh, I I'm uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, uh, on uh, the critic uh, criticism of uh, uh, Mochizuki Sage's theory in the context of uh, post-war Japanese Marxism ah okay. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, today I'm going to send all of you my papers. Uh, my papers uh, are not in the form of uh, PowerPoint, uh, simply old fashioned uh, uh, written <laughs> uh, words, but uh, this is better for, uh, for all of you to understand what I, what I mean uh, uh, logically or theoretically. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to discuss with you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Okay. We are also looking forward to your presentation and uh, see you then in two weeks. Okay. Thank you very much for participating today. And I really appreciate all of your comments. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.